Well, I'm very glad to be with you this morning, zooming in from this little village in Tal of Tarland in Aberdeenshire. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that what I have, I'm about to share today, I'm very heavily um, indebted to Cynthia Bojo in this book, um, The Holy Trinity and the Law of Three. Um, and if anybody wants to look at this in more detail, you might like to read that book. But first, let's pray. May the words I speak be imbued with the power of the eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, the source of all that is and shall be, father and mother of us all, the three in one. This is Trinity Sunday, and so I feel it's appropriate for me to say something about this very confusing topic this morning. But the truth of the Trinity has been there from the very beginning for those with eyes to see it and our hearts open to participate in its flow. Most of us, let's be honest, find it quite difficult to get our heads around the idea of the Trinity, that one God exists in three persons. For some, it's simply something to be put in the bottom drawer of, the, of our faith, for, and, but for others, it's a stumbling block. One of the reasons for this is that the terms Father, Son and Holy Spirit sound too patriarchal and exclude the feminine. It simply doesn't chime with today's world where gender equality is seen as vitally important. I suggest, however, that rather than to try and get your head around what I'm about to share, it's better just to catch a sense of the energy and flow. For the Trinity is not primarily a doctrine to debate but in an experience in which we are invited to participate. To be able to see the truth of the Trinity and participate in the, move, the movement of their sacred dance, we need the mindset of a mystic, an artist, a prophet, a visionary theologian. The Cappadocian fathers who had a deep experiential knowledge of God were the visionary theologians who, in the fourth century first attempted to put into words what they had intuited from experience was the truth. Part of the problem is that what we understand today by the word person is quite different from what the Cappadocian fathers meant. The Greek term that they used referred to the mask that actors wore to indicate different roles rather than to an individual person. What they were trying to express is that somehow, though God is one, he, she, is not solitary. Within the one God there are mutual relationships, different faces, as it were, that reflect one another. A German mystic, Jakob Bohm, had a vision in the year 1600 when he was just 24 years old, and it changed his life. He was just a humble shoemaker and hadn't had a university education. When some years later he wrote about this experience, he said, in one quarter of an hour I saw and knew more than if I'd been many years together at a university. It was twelve years of reflecting on this vision that gave rise to his mystical theology, in which he describes the Trinity not primarily as a static state of three interrelated persons, so much as a dynamic process that has been evolving in stages since before time and space. So, what if the Trinity is not a border checkpoint that restricts access to the Church, or extra baggage to be left behind, but a kaleidoscope of changing colours that inspires us to join in the process of transformation and work together towards a more hopeful future? What if the Trinity is not some obscure theological puzzle to test the curious and confused church members, but the key to helping young people see the relevance of the Christian faith for the future of the planet? And what if the Trinity does not consist of three fixed identities, but personifications of energy streams that flow and intertwine, like dancers around a maypole, and of the different states in which these have manifested over time. And yet, to talk of these energy streams in terms of personhood is not wrong either, for from eternity the essence quality of sacred unity was love, and out of that love the desire to manifest and relate in a space-time space universe arose, and at a certain point in time the process gave rise to a particular human person 
who in relationship with the divine origin of life that he called Father and his beloved companion Mary Magdalene manifested that love in a full and complete way. These flowing and intertwining energy streams within the Trinity, each at different stages, fulfill one of three independent and equal functions or forces. The active, wholly affirming, the passive or wholly denying, which is not to be viewed as a negative force, and the wholly reconciling force. All three are necessary and when intertwining and working together by emptying, each emptying itself into the other, the result in something new arising in the evolving story of the Trinity. Incidentally, this is a fundamental cosmic law called the Law of Three that governs how anything new comes into being. If our democratic institutions were to function according to this law, our politics would be transformed and so would our world. Because the resistant or denying force is not a problem to be overcome, but, an ascent, but is absolutely essential to a new arising. No resistance, no new arising. The enemy is not the problem, but the opportunity. And the problem will never be solved by silencing or eliminating the opposition, but only through enlarging our hearts sufficiently to hold the tension between opposites so that new possibilities open up. And the solution will often be a surprise, something counterintuitive, and the Trinity, uh, and the Trinity in the Law of Three demonstrate this demonstrates this perfectly. Or to change the metaphor, starting from three energies, three different threads are being sewn back and forward through a cloth that God is embroidering to create the pattern that has been in God's mind since the beginning. However, we only see the underside of the cloth, so we cannot make sense of the pattern except by some kind of eye-opening experience. So this image is just to give you an impression of the energy that's been interweaved in the unfolding story of the Trinity. At each new arising, the thread is brought back from the underside of the cloth to emerge as a counterstroke. Thus, each new arising has a lineage that goes back to previous stages of the development process and influences the form that the new arising takes, just as the DNA of the parent influences the form of the next generation. The wholly denying member of the Trinity, endless unity hidden in light, inaccessible, as the hymn puts it, remains static. Think of endless unity as the maypole around which the energies of the wholly affirming, the wholly reconciling, and the new arising dance changing places in each phase of the sacred dance. The process moves forward in seven stages, a bit like the seven stages in the first story of creation, Genesis 1, which describes another fundamental cosmic law, the law of seven, that governs how anything evolves and grows. Starting at an alpha point before space and time, within endless unity, there is the stirring of a desire to manifest as visible light and matter. It is a desire that is born of love, the essence of the eternal unity. However, that creates an agitation in the tranquility and equilibrium of eternity because there's a risk that the current state will become unbalanced and the tranquility will be disturbed since differentiation means difference. Thus endless unity becomes the wholly denying force. The reconciling force is like a fire sparked by the friction of wholly desiring and wholly denying energies. It is the fire of love and the light of pure awareness. These are the beginnings of the archetypical feminine and masculine energies and the source of self-reflective consciousness. What arises out of their initial dance is the, the light or word, which is known in John's Gospel as the Logos, and the reflective wisdom, love, Sophia. The masculine and feminine aspects of endless unity are joined, although in later stages they will be separated, and both are involved in the creation of the world at the next stage. The process ends in what Teilhard de Chardin called the Omega Point, when all things converge again, 
when everything in both the spiritual and physical dimensions are brought into a unity in Christ, only now retaining all the differentiations of function that have emerged in the process. In between there are five other stages, the primordial, creational, incarnational, messianic and Pentecostal trinities, during which endless unity as it manifests in the dimension of consciousness is seen increasingly as love. And linking each stage is the thread of counterstrokes that ends up being when all is united in the one in Christ. And the whole process, of course, is divided into two symmetrical phases, the phase of descent and the phase of ascent. This parallels what has happened to light energy in our space-time universe, where the descent is into increasingly restricted forms, from light to subatomic particles to atoms and then molecules, and the ascent is into increasing freedom and consciousness, from molecules to plants to animals to human beings. The descent phase of the Trinity is also into increasingly compressed forms, starting with the eternal word and culminating in the birth of Jesus Christ. And the ascent phase is into increasing breadth from the individual Jesus to the body of Christ. That's Christ man manifested in the many, and then to all things being united in Christ. The fulcrum, nadia, and turning point of this process is the incarnational trinity, when the word that emerged as the new arising of the primordial trinity and that gives birth in turn to the creation of matter eventually becomes flesh, becomes a human being. In Jesus, God's yearning to descend into form has reached its end point, the most dense and concentrated embeddedness in form that is divinely possible says Cynthia Bourgeau. From that point forward, the process moves increasingly towards the transcendent dimension from which it originated, in stages that mirror the phase of descent. But the forms in which the Trinity is expressed in the ascending phase retain the imprint of the historical Jesus who died and rose again. The Incarnational Trinity is the form the Trinity took during the time leading up to the birth of Jesus. That was when the active force of the Eternal Word that was God danced with the consenting human Mary around the Maypole of the Eternal Father, and the new arising was Jesus, the Word made flesh. The Messianic Trinity is the form the Trinity took during the life and ministry of Jesus. In that phase he embodied the reconciling force of the Trinity as the beloved Son. Mary Magdalene, his beloved companion, embodied the active force, for the ancient root of the Hebrew word woman means the power of creative initiative. And what arises out of the creative dance of, the Mary, and Jesus, of Mary and Jesus around the maypole of the endless unity after Jesus' death and resurrection is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all humanity at Pentecost. But now the breath of God's word that was the active force in the incarnational trinity has, through the incarnation and messianic phase, become forever changed to become the spirit of Christ incarnate. And after Pentecost, the Son is no longer the individual Jesus, but is the corporate body of Christ. That's you and me. And we take on the activating role in the ongoing drama of the unfolding trinity. We are called to demonstrate in word and action the self-emptying love that Jesus modelled in his teaching and his life. So you and I are participating in that same self-emptying dance of the evolving Trinity. And we as individual members have received the spirit of sonship, as Paul says in, 8, in Romans 8, and that sonship incorporates both the masculine and feminine aspects of divinity. So the feminine lives not in any permanently gendered persons of the Trinity, but in the energy of the divine wisdom that wells up from the very heart of the Trinity and emerges in all three kinds of energy, first in the primordial Trinity and then at each subsequent phase. What emerges as a result of the intertwining of the affirming body of Christ, the Son, and the re reconciling Holy Spirit in the dance around the maypole of endless unity 
is what Jesus called the kingdom or realm of heaven. And that refers to all that manifests in this world as a result of human beings collectively acting consciously in the power of the three energy streams of this evolving trinity that I've been talking about. And when, as a result, the whole of this world has been touched and transformed by that power, the story of the evolving trinity reaches its conclusion and fulfillment. And to lead us together until that time, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.